Metal. It's the Metal Show. No, just kidding. It's the Smart to Noise Ratio Pro Audio Podcast. And that that you just heard was the banging metal intro that my dear friend, Brian Savage, my boss, uh, made for us this week. That was actually a, a little piece that he had written for, believe it or not, a church service once upon a time that he uh, chopped up, rearranged, farmed out a little heavy metal guitar work, and just shipped it back to me. So thanks to him for that. Um, I know there's a savage track, dude. Savage track. <laughs> <laughs> so I know there's at least one other person. Uh, Fred, if you're out there listening, I'm still dying to hear what you're cooking up for us, and uh, that might be the closing credits. And uh, it doesn't have to be metal, I'll just say. It's, uh, Blue, but anyway. Bluegrass would be great. Sure. Actually, whatever. We love bluegrass. We, love, we, li- we, we like it all. Um, as you can maybe hear, we've got a room full of guys tonight. To my left is Anthony Kazubucky, house sound guy from The Tab, The Tabernacle in Orchard Park. To my right, you know him, you love him. He is the handsome devil audio maven about town, Carl Maciag. And all the way th- <laughs> and all the way to my right, we have my uh, business partner, Gordon Wood, who is, uh, he's still day jobbing it, unfortunately. He's a Electrical engineer, uh, systems control, controls tech. Uh, in the, uh, building automation systems engineer. Well, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's well, yeah, one of those gray areas. His business card is actually a trifold pamphlet. Uh, but he's also uh, a heck of a heck of a system engineer, audio engineer, and he's got just truckloads full of gear. He's, yeah. he's well, almost. That, that's what happens with the day job there. You get a little extra spending cash, you know. And it all goes into gear. <laughs> yep. Uh, so that's that's Gordon sitting over on the end. Uh, this show is going to be this is the gear show, first of many, I hope. Um, we're going to kind of start with live stuff, and we're just going to talk about you know, mics, cables, consoles, amps, speakers, any any other little piece of gear. Like maybe we might throw in some widgets in there, little useful bits to always have in your box. Um, and we're just we're going to talk about our, our stuff that we have, uh, favorite pieces, least favorite pieces, stuff that we wish we had, stuff that uh, might be in development now and coming down the pipe, and uh, just generally have a time of it. And uh, we got a, a slight outline here, but you never know where things are going to go. So we, it might just turn into funny, silly stories or, you know, fart jokes. Who knows? Chaos. We try to keep it somewhat clean, though. So if your kids are listening, you probably, you're probably safe. Uh, you don't have to send them out of the room. Uh, so anyway, uh, we're starting up here. I got mics first on my list, and I can lead off if you like. Uh, the, the mic that I know is going to cause my partner some consternation is I'm, I'm still a big fan of the classic SM58. He has a, he's mm. chuckling already. Oh, and somebody else. <laughs> I'm about to get beat down. No but, one else here. but you have to keep in mind the no background one. that I'm coming from. I did. Controversy. Construction is Ooh. the background he's coming from. <laughs> <laughs> I it's resemble that it's, it's a fairly useful right. hammer. So and he built a lot of houses with 58. A good mic. Um, <laughs> hey, they make excellent hammers. A good mic should be able to drive at least least a 20 penny pole bar nail and still go on stage and, and pick up a decent vocal but no seriously i mean it hasn't it hasn't been you know the industry standard for 40 years for nothing i mean it's and it's not claiming to be a, a neumann or anything like that and the thing of it is you can have a, a fat bass player knock it over and stomp on it a good number of times pick it up and beat the ball back into shape and signal still comes out so for a lot of the stuff that i was doing you know, like incredibly drunk bar bands really aggro angry metal punk death obnoxiousness bands that that was a go-to mic for me now there's there's definitely a lot of stuff that's better out there and gordon what what's your preferred mic then for live vocals uh my current one is the akg d3700 no longer currently available I was say, but, there's hey. just just the one tiny problem with that mic is <laughs> yeah <laughs> sorry all you people good luck on ebay because they don't even come up there very often but yeah. uh the road m1 is also a nice little alternative to the sm58 Looks like one, but doesn't sound like one. You can always do like the the Billy Joel from Green Day thing, where you have a, a fifty eight body with uh, oh yeah, it's not a bear. It's one of the uh, the German Telefunken. Yeah, I think he has a Telefunken capsule in a, a fifty eight body. Uh, Carl, what are you what are you using live? What's your favorite? Uh, if it's gonna be just uh, a run and go festival situation, I like the. The Sennheiser, either the 845 or the 945, mm-hmm. is uh, those are really nice. Yeah, and that's I, I love since you lent me or lent me those for the summer that that whole 900 series I love the Sennheiser mm-hmm. stuff. Um, and what I like a lot too are the the Audix OM series, not the OM2, but I like the OM6 and the OM7 a lot, especially for guys that really just kind of lay into it, and they don't move around a whole lot. As soon as they move, like, six or seven inches away, it's it's trash. But 
Or if they cup the mic. Ugh, that's yeah. a really good mic yeah. for them. I'm sorry, I've got the LM2, but they are kind of the beater mic in my case. Yeah, you don't, you don't really get them out unless you need to, or you don't like the people. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you, do you uh, find that they're fragile at all? Because I've, I've heard that uh, like tours that carry Audix vocal mics tend to carry two or even more of them, just in case. Um, I've got one for for the church that I work at. We've got a few different people. So for all the wireless, we have um, the Sennheiser 835 and 845 capsules on everything. Um, but there's a couple different guys. Like there's one guy that I've got on Beta 58, um, not the 58A, the original 58. And uh, the one singer who's got this unbelievably powerful voice I've got on the OM6 because he stays right in the sweet spot on it. And uh, he... Hits his teeth on it a lot. Um, I, I don't. I don't know how else to describe it. But he'll just. He'll be. You know, his eyes are closed and he's just strumming along. And there's the, for lack of better terms, there's a big black ball in his mouth. Um, and I, I haven't had any problems with it either. And then especially after services, you got 10, 15 kids running around knocking over my microphones and all that kind of stuff. I haven't had any problems with it yet. I just the set screw on the bottom came loose a couple times, and that's that's all I've had for problems with it. Nice. I'll say second in the running is actually uh, the Beta 57s. I think out of the Sure lineup is the one I prefer the most for vocals. That was, uh, um, for a long time in my time at Diesel Production, that was our go-to vocal mic. Every kit had at least six of them in it. And, uh, yeah, just seemed to be really nice. I really I like, like those. I like those a lot. Those are my most stolen mic, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I had six. I've got one. Ouch. Now the one that uh, when I need a little bit classier vocal mic, like if I get a you know a female blues singer, actually a female singer in general, uh, even if it's a rock act, I'll pull out the uh, SM eighty six. Now I'm a I'm an unapologetic Shure guy. I do have some other brands in my mic, but I, just, I like Shure stuff. Yeah, you know? but um, I was upgrading my rig a few years ago. I went up to Applied Audio and you know I told Zip across the counter, I was like, hey man, you know I'm looking probably going to get a you know a Beta eighty seven, but what do I want? You know the A or the C. And he reaches behind him into the rack and, like, almost without looking, just whack, pulls out an 86. He goes, try this out. So I took it home, and he never got it back. In fact, I ordered two more. And um, I don't know. Personally, I'm not wild about any of the beta stuff. I know I've, I've seen Carl mix a bunch on the uh, the beta 87s with good results. But I don't know. I just I don't know what it is about the beta series. I just have, the I've eight, never been. Oh, they're hyped. Yeah. They're hyped. The 87. You've seen me mix on them, but I don't think I ever did it with a smile on my face. Hmm. Um, what do you do with a smile on your face? Uh, <laughs> mix with Sennheiser. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, the 87, it's it's just hyped top end to me. It, it just doesn't sound natural. I, and, you know, I don't want to bash sure because they have mics that are the right tools for certain jobs. And it just a lot of times I think for the sounds I'm trying to achieve, I've I found better options. That's That's all. Um, they definitely make a quality product. It's, they're just not my first choice a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think if I'm going with a boutique uh, microphone, the first time I ever worked with a singer on a Neumann, was it the KMS 105? Yeah, 104, 105. Oh, yeah, my God. Have I, I've never had an easier time placing a vocal in a mix, male or female. Of course, we just microphone. went from $200 mics to $600 mics. Right, but. <laughs> yeah, but they are... Um, Unbelievable. Great game before feedback. Um, they're really hot, and they just, they, they don't cut through the mix. They sit the vocal on top of the mix, and that's the biggest difference. You know, it, you just, there's no fight with it. But what not I, often do I get to come across <laughs> right. what, what I like a lot with the, the 965, which is pretty much the same capsule, yes, um, but it's adjustable on, on the head, so you can have regular cardioid or, or super, um, and that, I've used the Neumann, and for girls, I like the 965 better, mm. um, on, on the super setting, it, it seems to, it, it kind of fattens out the low end a little bit more than the Neumann, at least from what I've found, and the, the, the top end on both of them is great, it's not too much, it doesn't make your ears bleed as soon as you plug it in, it just, it's nice, and it's clear, and it does exactly what I wanted to do mm -hmm. for that kind of person, and... As soon as I told them it was six hundred dollars, they said I need to find something cheaper. Mm -hmm. but. <laughs> uh, 
Well, yeah, I wanted to talk about, <clears throat> does anybody have anything you hate? Now, I know Gordon, he hates 58s. He actually has a, an anti-58 tattoo with a, you know, an SM there with a slash through it. Oh, there's a point when you need to bang in that nail, you know, yeah. so it can hang your banner and such, or if you really hate the band. When the drawbar just won't go back in the receiver. Yeah, or they just guy. keep nagging you. It's like, I really want a 58. Fine. <laughs> But uh, have you guys run into the, uh, was it the Sennheiser, the 835? I keep forgetting to look to see if it's in their propaganda, but for a long time, actually, I still run into it. Uh, female singers in rock bands, I don't know if it's in the, in the Sennheiser propaganda or the Guitar Center propaganda, but like, oh, here, you're a female singer? This is the mic you need. And, and you must have allergies all year because you sound awfully nasally. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's got this weird hump. Like, I feel like it would be a really good mic for a soprano to sing on because it does have, like, a, a rise in the, the low mids that, that might put some presence in there, you know, if, if you had a really high ethereal singer. But it's mostly, like, altos and, like, people singing Cheryl Crow songs. It's like, all right, well, <laughs> you brought some buildup. I'm chopping it out. Oh, geez, are we back at Alacy's with Cheryl Crow playing all night long yet again? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> we'll do this in a bar next time. <laughs> the eight, I'm trying to think my experience with the 35s. Yeah, it's got to be the right voice, you know? Like, the the guys that I'm working with now, we're actually using um, AT mics um, yeah. for their vocals in... The reason being is I had a really hard time with S's, where 58s did not work. Um, beta 57s were pretty good. Beta 58s were awful. 87s were out of the question. 945s, we were running for a while, and that was good. And then uh, we ran into a, a rep that let us try out, I think it's the AE 6100. Just they're dynamic mics, not condenser. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was pretty eye-opening and we've been using them ever since but that was i wouldn't use those on every voice it's just it worked for these guys and uh i don't know so try different stuff if you're working with the same people every time i know when i had the gig that john has now i think i went through maybe four different mics on the vocalist before i settled on what i went with you know for a while and uh it's just you, trial and error were you here when they bought those uh those sennheiser wireless no Okay. I had everybody on wired beta 57s. Mm -hmm. A couple of those are still around. I don't know where the rest of them went. Yeah. <laughs> I think I have two so left. The same guy with steel and mine still yeah, all yours, right. too. But uh, we, every vocalist in my house now, so that'll be usually any given week, like six people are all on uh, Sennheiser EW100 series cardioid condensers, and I've been pretty happy with those. Like, they're just, they're really good. Like, I haven't found anybody that sounds bad on them, really. Like, <clears throat> and I don't have to use a ton of EQ to straighten them out. There's not a ton of proximity effect in them. And that's actually another thing about uh, Carl's current gig, the guys he's mixing. It's a pair of brothers who are uh, like just both powerhouses, both get right on the mic and are both incredibly present at, I don't know, like 160, 180. Mm -hmm. So it's the Hoisington hump. Yeah, 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 we actually, <laughs> when we mix other people, you can say to the other, hey, take out the Hoisingtons. And that means, you know, big dip at 180 on the vocal channel. Uh all right, cool. Anybody, anything else about mics? Anything spring to mind while we've been talking here? The Sennheiser 609s on guitars were a revelation to me. Oh, yeah. And never, never again will I put a 57 on a guitar cab. Um, yeah. It's just, <laughs> I don't know. It's like you heard the guitar and it sounded the, not the same, but it sounded closer. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a big happy day when I bought a pair of those and... Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm just, it's not that I'm anti-SM57, I just don't use them. Yeah, if I had to use one guitar mic, it would definitely be a 609, but I stumbled on this, and I, I knew it had been done forever. I mean, you always hear about big tours and studio guys that, you know, there's all these stacks of amps and mics everywhere, but uh, I was mixing festival style in a little club. You know, I had five or six bands to get on and off a stage in a night, and I just bought a pair of 609s, so along with... You know, 57 stage left and stage right. I put a 609 out with them, and I thought, all right, you know, if I get a kid with a really tinny, thin-sounding amp, I'll put the 609 on, and if somebody with some beefier sound comes up, I'll put the 57 up. But the idea was I just, because I was doing changeovers myself, I'd go up, throw both mics on, go back to the mix, and at sound check, I'd A, B them, and then pick the, the one that I liked. Well, first kid comes up, strums a chord, I go 57, put that down, put 609 up, put the 57 back up a little bit, and I struck gold right there yeah. with the EQ straight up, yeah. just playing back and forth, and there's not, you know, what it is is comb filtering from the phase interactions, and, you know, I don't, I don't chart it out, 
Um, I don't even place my my mics all that carefully unless I'm I'm really trying to get an exact duplicate of somebody's sound. If I'm just trying to get close and go, I'll just throw them both on there. Usually the 57's angled in a little bit and just off the edge of the cone. And the 609, a lot of times just dangling straight on, hanging on the grill cloth. And uh, it's even with some really obnoxious, obnoxiously bad guitar tones, the EQs are pretty much straight up, and I can shove them around somewhere and, and get decent tone out of it. And uh, the other thing I like about that is, you know, especially if it's a guitar player I'm working with all the time, like here, or, you know, I would tend to get adopted by bar bands and just do gig after gig with them. Um, so I didn't create ear fatigue. Every time a guitar solo came up, I would actually have the, the guitar player not step on a lead channel unless he really needed to, and I would just swap those mics. I tend to run with the fat channel a little higher, and then that fit skinny 57 channel just kind of filling in a little brightness, uh, adding a little extra depth, and, and doing whatever comb filtering it's going to do. But if I switch them and literally just, you know, if the 609 is 5 dB hotter than the 57, just swap places, suddenly that guitar is cutting right through, but it's not any louder. And for a lot of solos, that's all I'll do. Anybody else got any other good mic tricks while we're at it? I don't know about um, mic tricks, but do we dare enter the realm of drum miking? I was just I was, thinking we yeah. could we could go there. Drum mics and yeah. what else? Bass bass cab mics. You actually use them or not? Or if we just use DIs? And thank you, Radial, I, for opening my yeah, eyes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Since the radials, I don't mic anymore. At least not here. <laughs> I hate you, John. Yeah, when I, when I love I, you, but I hate you. <laughs> when I did, I would use a four twenty one. Yeah. Nice. Beta 52 sometimes, but usually a 421 on a bass. Um, drums, kick drum has been kind of a thing I've, I've experimented with a lot. And uh, trying to remember who in the rags wrote about it all the time in Live Sound International, but something that I really um, picked up on was using a, a Beta 91 or an SM91 in a 421, both of them in the drum, and getting the the SM91 as close to the beater head as possible, then putting the 421 inside the drum but facing it out towards the resonant head, and uh, I've been able to get some really cool sounds with that. You flip um, polarity on the... I w yeah, I flip polarity, but... Sometimes I keep them in polarity, whatever sounds best at the time. Mm. And uh, if not a 421, then like a, a Beta uh, 52, or if I'm really lucky, like an RE20 yeah. inside the drum mm -hmm. at the resonant head. And uh, it, it gives a really natural drum sound. Like you really hear the uh, the tone of the drum, but you still get the, the low-end thump that you want. and uh, And you don't have... That's one less one less stand to knock over right. um, mm -hmm. during the course of the show. When right. I was just starting out, I actually used an RE20 for a drum overhead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I was starting out, um, RIT Tecker was the first place that hired me, and they had 421s for every tom, and I was like, that's pretty nice, but that's a lot of stands. More, yeah. money, more money than the actual drum kit costs. Yeah. Oh, I wish I could do 421s <laughs> on every tom. That's, that's my floor tom, Mike, 421. Yeah. We had a bunch of those where I went to school, and I haven't seen them since... No, it's, it's it's less in favor. Like the uh, really like the D series Audix drum mics. Those are really easy to just get the sound that you're looking for. Like they sound like the drum, but better in a lot of cases. You don't even have to tune them most of the time. Like on on Sunday mornings, we've got our our drum kits in the cage because our our ceilings are pitched up and the floor comes up. So at the back of the sanctuary, the the actual room height is about ten feet shorter than it is way up front. So we've got the drums in a cage. And it's it's pretty soundproof. Like you get you know your, your fat overtones and stuff, but nothing that cuts through too bad. So if I don't get a chance to go in there during the week and tune stuff up, and the air conditioning's on and off and and drums sync and stuff, if you just get them close, they sound they sound fantastic for a live setting at least. For studio stuff, I'd rather have four twenty ones. But um, even recording stuff recently, I've used the Audix stuff, um, and I've got a crappy room to record drums in, but they come out sounding really really nice. Like they're they're full and they're punchy. As long as you've got a guy that plays with some kind of dynamic, doesn't just beat the living piss out of everything. Mm -hmm. um, they, they turn out really nice. I found that they're you only get one sound out of them. At yeah. least to me, the D six. I remember when that came out. Um, I was on a tour, and one of the other opening engineers had one, and we were you know sharing swapping mics all the time on that tour. And uh, my drummer loved the sound of the D6 in his wedge, but I didn't necessarily dig it in the house. So I 
kept my setup, so we ended up using a third. No, we didn't add it as a third. I was using a 91 and a 52, and then we switched it to a 91 and a D6, and, uh, you know, it was okay. I found myself Sounds hacking like a the beater. Yeah, I found myself hacking the D6 up a little bit, but, um, you know, it worked good. But the drummer, all he wanted was the D6 um, in his drum fill, and he was really happy because it just gave him a nice low end and a lot of attack. And, you know, I, I wanted a little more lower mids than what it was offering. But I have found that on uh, drums that don't actually have the port, the D6 just kind of falls flat on its face. Mm. But what, if I can get in close to the beater, then it seems to work pretty well just about every time. What I've gotten to use a couple times, and I absolutely love them, and I need to buy one, but I've just bought new kick mics anyways. It's going to be a while. But um, the Heil PR... 40 or something. I've been like wanting that. to get into their they, entire line, and on, they sound unbelievable. Yeah. It's, I mean, yeah, you, you got to fiddle with it a little bit, but if you've got it, it's not something for a junk drum kit. If you've got a, a nice drum kit that you're working with, and you actually want to hear the sound of the kick drum, not just thud, mm-hmm. that's that's the way to go. We had um, a conference at the church a while ago, and this the drummer bought. Um, do you guys remember the group, the Indigo Girls? Yeah. He bought their drum kit. Okay. So it's uh, it's the same one that Peter has, the Yamaha Maple Custom. Oh, beautiful kit. That, that they don't make anymore. Um, and the kick drum is something like, like 10 plies. It's three plies thicker than whatever it usually is. And it's uh, we just put it in there, fiddled around with the EQ just a little bit because our room is awful. And uh, it sounds like a million dollars. It sounds like something right off of a perfect circle mm-hmm. recording. Um, that and... Uh, for, for snare mics, we started using the i5, the Aux i5. I've used it a couple times. And that, I got that, Joey told me. We, yeah, I was just going to say, <laughs> when he produced our last two <clears throat> records, yeah, um, that was a snare mic that we used, and that, it, yeah. It, it's perfect. It doesn't, it, it does all the stuff that you want a 57 to do, but you can't, and you can beat the living piss out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Also like, use the D2 on snare on occasion really? if the snare's like overly bright. Yeah. Really? Yeah. That I haven't done. Yeah. But yeah, so for like for pork pies, yes, <laughs> yeah. ten inch, ten inch deep pork pies that still sound like piccolo snare. Yeah. <laughs> what about uh, bottom snare mics? Um, for recording, I like I like the i five on top and an SM eighty one on the bottom. Mm-hmm. Um, that I found it, when when I did uh, the record that I'm doing now, um, we we messed around for a few days just getting right mic right mic sounds and. We use the D series and all the toms because I don't have an extra eight hundred dollars to go out and buy that many four twenty ones. Um, use the i five on the top, eighty one on the bottom. We used a Rode NT five on the ride symbol, mm-hmm. which was way too hot, so we had to put an inline pad on that because I couldn't get it quiet enough. <laughs> but it, it sounds great; like it picks up the full resonance use, using a, a K Custom Hybrid ride. Um, I think that's my, my new favorite. Were you running the top or the bottom of the cymbal? Um, he was actually running, he plays right-handed, but he plays ride, um, oh, okay. so he plays, like, the kit's set up like a right-handed kit, but the, he plays hi-hat and ride with his mm-hmm. left hand, and, um, stare at his right, but, uh. Just to interject he, for just a second yeah. about the Rode NT5, John, you can attest to this, in this church we had placed an NT2000 oh, up on stage. Now, how far back is it to your uh, little crow's nest there? 85 feet to the mix. 85 feet to the mix, and we heard him click the mouse back through the cans. You're, you're taking some, so some much. Uh, <laughs> impulses for uh, an impulse generator uh, reverb. You know, I had a kid stand on a stage ready to bang wood blocks together, and I, I clicked go, and I heard it from <laughs> 85 feet away. <laughs> and I've got two of the NT2000s and two of the K2s, so far, I can't actually tell too much of a difference in initial testing, but they've been used to record theater organ, and they go just about all the way down, except for 16 hertz. We had to fake that a little bit, but... <laughs> so, so almost to DC. Pretty, <laughs> pretty darn near. But, so we, we used that. Uh, what did we use? We used, uh, I think we used an 81 on the hi-hat, too, because I had an extra one of those. But the, the ride symbols, he had two ride symbols. He had the, the K Custom Hybrid. Then he had this old, nasty-looking, like, you found in the back of a garage, and he just threw it out. It came with an old drum set they bought. It was a Pearl CX 300. It looks awful. It looked like it's that ride symbol that you find in the back of the garage. And you're like, Oh, we should probably just throw this out and not, mm-hmm. not acknowledge that we found it. But, um, for real type jazz type stuff, he drilled holes in it, put rivets in it. It sounds fantastic for just that real, real tickly ride type thing. So mm-hmm. what we did is we, we stacked the rides next to each other and put the, uh, 
the NT5 behind it, um, pointing right at the, the edge of both of them. And it caught just enough, because for overheads we used KSM-44s, um, cardioid rolling off, and those sounded fantastic, especially with, uh, he's playing a Gretsch USA Custom Kit. Um, and those toms sound fantastic. I don't care what anybody says about DWs. I think, I think Gretsch toms blow DW out of the water. Um, I like, I like Peter's pork pie toms a lot though. Those sound huge. Yeah. For, they're only like six inches or seven inches deep, right? I don't remember, but I remember the first time I, we were at a Syr the Syracuse War Memorial. That was our first gig with that kit, kit. And, uh, I had a 421 on the floor and Flat EQ brought it up in the house, and the entire production company <laughs> stopped what they were doing, just like in use and went, whoa. <laughs> um, yeah, I think with drums, I like dynamic microphones on all of the drums, you know, save, you know, like a 91 on, on the kick. Um, sometimes I'll do an 81 on the snare bottom, but I like. I don't know. I, 906? I don't... I didn't care for that mic. Yeah. I don't know. It didn't seem to get low enough for me. For the bo for a bottom head? Yeah. It seemed like that mic started losing stuff um, below 80. Hmm. And, uh, you know, so I kind of wrote that one off. Like, I bought it and sold it maybe two months later. Hmm. Um but I've heard people use it with really good results, so you know maybe I just didn't give it a good enough chance. Um, but then for like hi hats, rides, overheads, I like condensers, and I, I find I lean more and more towards AKG for condensers. <laughs> Gordon's um, got his thumbs in the air. <laughs> yeah, so I have. I, I finally convinced John after how many years? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I have a pair of older 451s that I happened upon that I love for hi hat and ride. Which uh, and, which uh, four fifty? Because they had the silver ones. Silver are those the, the C's? Or no? uh, I have a I have I a pair of four fifty one so. EBs that I think they only made for a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, and those yeah. were interchangeable heads, I believe, too. Mm -hmm. Right. Which I can't find anything. Other yeah, than. the one the <laughs> one actually has like the ninety degree, mm -hmm. um, or actually no, that would be a hundred eighty degree, ro you know, rotation thing where you can do it weird or whatever, which I don't really use. Um, but those have a nice straight up airy sound but the other model that i like for hi hat and rides are the ck capsules with the is it the night the 91 cardioid head and uh those are great when you need to get like some sizzle out of the hats in the ride as opposed to an airiness to them um those are really great and then like in a perfect world 414s you know on overheads are Awesome, but you know. I've heard some guys get pretty cool results out of the uh, the Earthworks. I forget the model number. The one, they're the ones that look like really they're, anything they're, Earthworks. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. As long as it says Earthworks on it, it'll probably. The ones uh, they sort they they look similar to like the calibrated mics you'd see on an RTA. They like mm -hmm. they start out you know about an inch in diameter and then they're they're pencil thin at the end. Yeah, yeah. and those, those are, are pretty cool until you drop them. For Sorry, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't quite go for the four fourteens, just budgetary constraints. But yep. I do have three thousands for recording, then uh, C four thirties. Those are great mics. I forget about those ones, yeah. but those are great. Do you, got, do you guys prefer large or small diaphragm for overheads? Large. Uh, yeah, large. I prefer large, but for live, just to keep them from being bashed to smithereens. You <laughs> ended up with the C430s. <laughs> Although those always, you have to make sure you don't lose because they're kind of tiny. Yeah. I always do small. Yeah, I like the 430s for, for overheads, too, especially if you're mixing mono. You, they're wide enough. You can get away with one. Yep. And uh, Actually, another trick. You guys, all right, I'll... I'll I'll brace myself for another beating. I actually in small venues I use a fifty seven, a single fifty seven for an overhead. Oh no, that we've all had to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Where the cymbals are too much but you need just a little bit more. Right. Yeah. Because, no. because the drummer's had more than one handle of whiskey in a night and there's a real good chance that he's gonna <laughs> grab it and start swinging around like a slingshot at one point or another while he's still trying to play drums. Exactly. And when the yeah. air's mushy, you know, when it's ninety eight degrees out still at midnight and hundred percent humidity and you wanna cut through a little bit but you don't want to put anything good out there. Fifty seven will work <laughs> just fine, get you just enough crash and sizzle to get you through the night. Yep. 
All right. Well, cool. We burned up almost half the show talking about mics. This probably should have just been the mic show. <laughs> we'll just I, keep going. I, I build pianos. it. Well, save something for. Oh gosh, don't even start a piano. <laughs> oh boy, oh, that's a complicated <laughs> subject right there. Yeah. Gordon could probably do a whole show on how to mic pipe organs because it takes what at least like thirty six mics to do properly. Or oh no, 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 no! <laughs> just very careful placement. There you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, let's move on. Let's let's make it a kind of a rounded out event. Um, I'm going to skip over cables and stands because yeah, whatever. You get what you pay for. Yeah, um, make them yourself. The ones that work. Exactly. <laughs> that you don't have to replace clutches on every two months. Right. Yeah. That's probably going right in the mic, by the way. Are you playing with your glasses there? <laughs> yeah, knock it <laughs> off. Just, just stalled the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can edit that out. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, but let's uh, let's go on to uh, consoles. Yes. <laughs> okay, here's the second half of the show. Oh, boy. <laughs> and yeah. and cabs will have to come next yep, week. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like I like Mackie right? I like Mackie stuff when I can't get Behringer. So <laughs> oh. Wow, how about Samick? There's there's a company called <laughs> Rolls. Peavy that you have. Oh no, Peavy makes a great console. Like, oh, they have a, I can afford they have a to be sanctuary series that you should just get rid of that Midas. <laughs> I can afford to be snotty now because my my employer owns a fairly nice Midas that I get to drive. But uh, <laughs> see, I'm myself. I'm mixing on a Midas Legend three thousand, and I'm actually. I'm gonna miss it a little bit when we go digital here. It's like it's got some neat dual dual purpose. Still if still the price is right, with <laughs> the sound sound monitor does? No, the Soundcraft is that still? Sound no, no, that's GPG property now. Oh no, yeah, they came and got that. Okay, all right. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he made thought of that. He lost an SI too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's not at Gordon's house or anything. They the, the guy. I offered <laughs> many times, many times. The people that was yeah, Harmon International totally got that back from us. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we'll have to cut that. Yeah. <laughs> um. But yeah, I got. I have a, a Legend three thousand forty eight channel, uh, twelve augs, eight bus, ten VCA console, and the thing I really like about it is it's got. Uh, a monitor master fader on every channel, and uh, it's, I'm, I've been thinking about how I'm going to duplicate that kind of functionality on a digital desk. And uh, it actually has a separate monitor button for a separate mute button for the monitor feeds, which I use a fair amount for a lot of different things. So that's it's going to take some careful thought and planning when I finally go digital here. You can automate that. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's not as easy as that second big red button on every channel. True. Um, but I'm willing to give that up to have dynamic. To have to have the processing power, I'm I'm willing to work a little harder on my my scenes and snapshots and stuff. John, you know I've got plenty of compression for you anytime you need it. You just <laughs> got to figure out how to get it up the stairs. Yeah, on well, budget, I have to budget. Yeah, running a huge tube rack of compressors. Um, I need yeah, it out of my office. You can take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, real estate. Enough to I, give it a nice warm home for the winter. It's a tiny <laughs> office, <laughs> which he's currently heating with with Gordon's tube compressor. Rack. I, haven't, I haven't turned the heat on since October. <laughs> Please tell me they haven't been on that long. I'm going to have to retube everything. Well, some of them aren't on anymore. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. The church has insurance, right? <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I had to claw my way up. I started on, well, actually a mixer that my buddy built for me. <laughs> and then I got a Radio Shack DJ mixer, worked oh. my way up to a Gemini DJ mixer. First real mixer that I mixed on was my buddy's Rolls 8 channel. Yeah, I had a Samick and then I added a Rolls 6 channel to it to get more channels. And I finally, I had a Mackie 2404, SR2442, when when that was a revolutionary console. When Sorry, my, I went Mix Wizard. Right. <laughs> well, but, you know, well, okay, yeah, so you made you made a jump, but you didn't have 24 channels. So, oh, like, this at, is true. At the time, it was great better. because it was, it was the same, <laughs> roughly the same cost and the same physical size as, like, a PD or a Yamaha 16 channel. It just had way, way more, you know, an actual sweet mid-EQ, six auxes, four buses, Inserts on everything. It was it was like really brought what would have been like mid sized console features down into the small format size. When when I started at the church, well, not started working there, but when I started actually mixing there, I or they they let me touch the stuff. I was about ten or eleven years old, and they had one of those, but they had the sidecar with another twenty four on top of it. Yeah. Is that the eight bus? The eight bus yeah. would do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. I was eleven. I was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that was, so you must have some of the flip switches <laughs> on that stupid <laughs> that. Did that take it up to 52? I think so. I, it, that, it was, uh, there was a 52 here before they got the Legend. It crashed so many times. That was a digital, wasn't it? No. No? No, it was a Mackie 8 bus, 52 input, and it, it just crashed, oh, crashed, that was crashed, crashed, crashed. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Mm-hmm. And um, So they had had enough, and it was right when the Legend was introduced, and they got an introductory price on it, and that's how it ended up. Playing with that thing, pretty nice. Yeah. What, now, what was your, which which console got stolen out of here? What? I don't know. It wasn't when you were here. I missed that. 
Yeah. Oh, I swear it's ago. not on my truck. <laughs> yeah. That Kevin, uh, when he went out to work at that church in Rochester, he, he found, like, there was, there was just a room of burnout with the GL 3800s. They just, they just kept cooking them. He's like, yeah, there were, like, three of them just on a shelf because the guy you never turned them off. He's like, they, they were on their fourth console by the time I got there. <laughs> I've never, I mean, I, the, I know they smell like they're on fire all the time. Right. But I've never actually seen one get cooked, <laughs> much less a room full of 3,800s that are just I remember just looking at fried. Those. You think there's anything we can do with these? <laughs> yeah, throw them out. <laughs> <laughs> I know somebody around here that will rebuild them for a small fee mm. and a few months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's consoles repaired while you wait and wait, wait. <laughs> and wait. <laughs> uh, so, Carl, you got any faves? Soundcraft VI series. Yeah, buddy. Um, What's well, cheaper that we can afford? <laughs> well, you wanted to know my favorite. Um, the reason being, it was the first time I was on a digital console that I felt I was working faster than I would in the analog world, and that that's always been my gripe with digital. Is no, that was it, that like first time out with it, or after a little bit of tinkering around? No, no. I mean. I had it. I had it on demo, so I spent an afternoon with it, and then uh, when the band finally came in, um, it was boom. I mean, so fast, and you know, mid show, being able to see what all the dynamics were doing and what the EQ curve looked like, and all of that. You know, it's you, you don't think much about it, but in the analog world, well, I want to see what my dynamics are doing. So you're turning your head ninety degrees, and on this desk, I'm not. I'm not even touching a menu button. I'm literally just looking at the screen and I'm seeing everything. Um, that was really refreshing. Um, that was also the first time I had worked on a digital desk that was actually using um, a digital snake, where the preamps were on stage and really just the the console was a control surface and not having you know in, in this building you know the. 325 to 400 feet of <laughs> copper the and all that capacitance build up. Um, that, that just brought the sound so much closer. Um, they actually have lightning in the sanctuary sometimes when the, when the snake <laughs> discharges, if you get too close to it. Right. Um, <laughs> that's just on weeks that you're being bad, John. Yeah. yeah. So that's, I guess right now, you know, that's, that's my favorite one. Um, I haven't spent much time on the Midas pro series, but that, you know, when I it, that's been on demo floor stuff. I haven't mixed the band through it, but I'm looking pretty hard at that. Yeah, one. that looks really good too. Um, in the analog world, um, uh, Heritage. I mean, you can't go wrong with a, really a Heritage three really K. <laughs> um, yeah. When when we went and saw Foo Fighters, we were sitting. We got we got bumped up to floor seats because I, I won a contest, and they had the the first two opening bands both had PM five Ds. Or no, mm. I'm sorry, the the first opening band. I uh, had a PM5D, and then I think, I can't remember who the second band was, but they had an old H3K, yeah. the old gray ones that look real dirty, and then Foo Fighters, who I'm sure could have whatever console they want, mm -hmm. are still running through an H3K, an old one, too. It's not even new and pretty. Yeah, That's what you see around, though. Like, at yeah. the festivals, you look around, as you know, you got an Avid desk going through, you got a VI and an SI, and Roman Midas stuff driving, going uh, through. What's Roman Drive? An XL? Or but yeah, like, XL200. Like, yeah. when they say the Midas yeah. guys, they mean the guys that will not park with their H3Ks. Yeah. What was it, two ACDC tours ago? He was on a Midas desk, but it was from the 70s that he had yeah. restored. Mm. And, uh, you know, I think it was 24 inputs. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's all he needed. That's yeah, ACDC. Yeah. 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 But, uh, um, yeah, it's just, you know, if you've ever been on one, you know, it's like... Um, it's hard to go back. Yeah, it's like being, you know, everybody loves a Corvette, but once you drive an Aston Martin, you don't want to go back to your Corvette, <laughs> you know? Um, so, yeah, with the... Yeah. I really like the, uh, in the analog world, the monitor desk they have over at the uh, town ballroom. is a GL... 4,000, I think? Mm, no, that was an ML, ML. 5,000. Right, right. ML 5, I was going to say ML 4,000. ML yeah. 5,000. Giant, giant. Gets really warm. <laughs> like, talk about... <laughs> monitor world is often called sitting in the hot seat. And yeah, you yeah, behind that desk. It, it. it really is, yeah. You, you can yeah. fry an egg on that thing. But gorgeous console. I've actually heard uh, the technical director over there would bring his band in, and they just track some songs directly through that desk. And the stuff... Like, he played it back for me. I was like, where'd you make that? He's like, on stage here. 
Yeah. Yeah. Pretty sweet desk. Some other consoles I'm starting to keep an eye on, APB Dynasonics. Awesome. Yeah. Those little awesome. boutique makers, the APB stuff is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Now you and not that got, horribly priced either. Yeah. Yeah. I believe the guys running that company were at Crest doing the Crest consoles before they got bought out by P V. Yeah, so if that you was ever a sad on, day on the uh, amplifier topic. Yeah, if you ever <laughs> been on like a uh, a Crest X8, which is another awesome desk. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that what they have down at um, the uh, Kino did a show there not too long ago? Um, oh. The Trelf. So they have upstairs there. It's something that, different every five that, minutes in the Trelf. That might be <laughs> not no, the it was, it was X8. A it, it was a probably crest. a Crest Century. Okay. I, that's think, I, I think that desk is at. I think that was sold in the Mohawk place. Oh. But yeah, they they upgraded. Where that was they put that in Mohawk. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, yeah, it barely, yeah, it barely fits. I think that was a fifty-six or a forty-eight. Yeah, it was, it was a fifty. No, no, this was a smaller one. Oh, this no, was, no, this was at Mohawk. Was a big okay, yeah, this but was I, at least six foot wide. That they had a couple Crest Centuries, the Indigo that was. Um, yeah, those are great modular. Um, you know, so you could really customize uh, what you had on that console but yeah the older crest stuff was really good and sounds really nice and now uh, gordon's one of his daily drivers is the uh Prisonis 24 digital yep. which has hit a, a road bump or two was it what was it that the ps went bad on that and tried uh, a bunch of channels that, that's the only thing that i can think of is the power supply took out a few things and we ended up doing a show i think what was that right around christmas time and all of a sudden we're like okay so we have Nearly 24 inputs, and we're down seven channels. Okay, let's go back to minimalist mic techniques. Yeah, <laughs> chopped a lot of stuff out. But yeah, otherwise, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's definitely not the greatest sounding console out there. But what did it cost? Like, yeah, it's like 3200. Yeah, which is the point right. that I got it. I think I actually got it for like 27. So, and, and for smaller type stuff, you don't need to bring as much outboard with you. Right. Yeah. Which for bars, I don't great. even bother bringing an outboard other than. Maybe if I'm feeling really nice, I'll bring in like another reverb unit or. Yeah. And I've used it for theater without. A, it's actually out on a theater gig right now without a stitch of outboard gear on it. It's got plenty of processing. And it's a little bit, little bit noisy when you have a lot of gain on all the inputs. Yeah. Um. But whatever. I mean, it's yeah. Exactly. For the multi turn on the expanders that it is. and yeah, it's it's so nice having everything and it's not the smoothest workflow ever. But mm -hmm. you got to right. spend a lot more money before you get into a fat channel. Right. It's more yeah. usable. And it's really not that bad because really it's as far as the channel strip goes it just runs horizontally instead of vertically like we're all used to so until so you get used to it you have a little bit of a crook in your neck from looking at it like a, a confused right, dog right. Yeah. Um, i think i think that one sounds fine um the gig that we were on last weekend that that was the the console there mm -hmm. and um Polly, our our house guy we determined very early on that even though it's a digital finger quotes console um we're not comfortable treating it as such um as far as the automation and stuff like that, getting through sound check was a challenge because whatever preset the house recalled, there was some weird stuff going on that was, you know, like we would have to, you know, readjust, you know, the, yeah. the aux masters and stuff like that. Because even though it said unity, it wasn't saved at unity. And, you know, um, that's the one thing I wish they would have done on that. It's right. fully like right. V, v pots and flying faders would yeah. have made it a true recall. Console. Well, that's, that's why the cost is so far down yeah. on it. But I think right. if you go into it with the mindset of, okay, I'm treating this as an analog console that has effects and processing built in. That's I think, exactly you'll, where I, was. I think you'll be great. And I think, you know, that console can meet a lot of needs for a lot of people and really improve, um, and be the sound. able to expand them by, Linking multiples together was a nice right. advantage as well. And, yeah. and use it in a, in a quick situation for live tracking, too. Yeah, the live yeah. tracking oh, yeah. feature is great. I, I took 24 tracks of direct out from my console here, recorded our, our Christmas production. Yeah. I was actually just about to buy John's old ADAT, H, what was it, just the HD, 24. not the 24? Or no, HD24. HD24, yeah. 24, and I'm just like, you know what? Personas, yeah. like, it solves my needing a few more channels. Right. There, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's great for, we just built a new room, and we, we're going a different route with... Than what than what you would normally think. Like instead of having an amp rack in the back, we're going. It's it's a smaller, more lecture type room. So up top, we're flying um, QSC KW 152s. Um, they're like, well, you know, we need to keep the budget down on it because it's not going to be a concert hall. It's going to be more for speaking, teaching, small seminar type things. And instead of going out and getting tons of compression and and all kinds of effects, like if if I need if they're going to have someone playing piano in there, 
I don't need more reverb than what's already there. Like it's, it's not it, the room seats about 150, so there's there's no real reason for expanding that much and getting that much gear when all you really need for that room is is already in the desk. Yeah. And actually, I kind of like it for a live console because I can recall. Like if I'm going into a theater gig, you know, I'll pull out one wireless mic, pin it on, check that channel out, engage all the EQs, set my high pass, and you know, do a few signal routing things. And then if I have, you know, 19 more mics to do, I can just hit copy, load, it does that whole mothership light show thing, and all my channels are set. And then I can just go through and, and check my routing. Yeah, that um, is one thing I actually don't like about it is the uh, actual, like, EQ section as far as the graphs go. They just seem a little bit harder to get at than they should be. And the not being able to copy other than in stereo pairs is a bit on the annoying side. But Yeah. It takes a little bit to, to actually read. Cause if, if you're outside, like last year when we did that, no, oh, that yeah. little festival, like the lights aren't really bright enough. They're it's kind of they're not clear, yeah. so the light doesn't come mainly through, on like, the buttons. Frosted. The display is fine, but yeah, the, yeah. the display also, is fine. But we haven't tried anything yet with like interfacing with the computer because I mean right. you can mix live with the thing and basically use your laptop as a, a display to get a big get the big picture going or, right. or your iPad or yeah. whatever. And, and trying to just look down and be like, all right, so I, I actually need... I uh, did actually do a show over the winter at the uh, Auditorium Center uh, just with remote desktop. It actually worked out fairly well. Oh, I'd forgotten you had done it. Yep. So yeah, that's, iPad would have been a lot nicer, but I haven't quite got the cash for that just yet. Wave there. You know, a few years ago, I never would have figured that you could go to like a bar gig, leave your digital mixer on stage, take your iPad out, and grab a seat in the back of the room and not have snakes and a front of house position and all that other stuff. Pretty cool that that level of technology has trickled down to $200 a night bar gigs. I think that that's what gave Yamaha a little bit of a head start with some of their digital stuff, their smaller stuff, because the M7 and the, the LS9, you can control. I think Kevin had one of those at, at the, the chapel complex downtown. He would just walk around on his phone and mix from there, go up on stage, mix monitors from his phone. And that that was great. And then now Personas is getting into that kind of stuff and a couple other consoles. But for a while, for smaller and, and less expensive type stuff, I think Yamaha made a decent amount of cash just for that sole purpose. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. Well, without beating consoles to death, looks like we got enough time. Uh, yeah, there's a couple minutes left. Um, why don't we do amps and cabs quick, and then for the last minute, we'll uh, we'll talk about any little bits of processing gear that we like. Uh, Gordon, well, I could spend a lot on processing time. Right. <laughs> That's why I'm going to save it till the end. And we'll make, <laughs> we'll we'll use that as a I'm just prep for the next show. Um, on the subject of cabs, and this is coming up shortly. Uh, Gordon and I are actually at, we're both. Uh, our systems are both deployed with other operators on theater shows this week. When we're done, uh, we're going to get together and do a shootout of some of these new little uh, self-powered jobs that came out. I just bought K10s to use as wedges and to use around at, at my day job just for pole speakers for stuff. Um, and Gordon bought EV... Yeah, yeah ELX 115Ps. So not a, it's not going to be a straight-up shootout because he's got a, a 15-2 combo and I've got a 10-2 combo. But right, uh, we're right. going to... Plastic cabinet to wood cabinet. Right. So we're just going to we're gonna get them out in the backyard somewhere and blow some sound through them and see what we think and do a little product review on those. And then I'm also looking at picking up uh, some of the KW, which is the wood-cased model uh, of the QSC stuff. Um I haven't decided what yet exactly, but I'm going to be using those for mains along with some powered subs. Uh, and Anthony just mentioned he was going to use some of the same some of those same boxes in his venue. So that's definitely something that's the wave of the future. It's speaking as a guy who blew out his back and had to have some pretty serious surgery to fix it, moving big heavy stuff around, I immediately my friends were a little concerned because I was also kind of high on pain pills. But decided I was like, <laughs> guys, I'm selling everything. I'm getting these little powered boxes. It's gonna be awesome. I think they were calling my wife like, uh, is, is was John you were saying that while you were in the hospital recovering? Screw yes. this, this monitor rack crap. I'm getting all in one. <laughs> yeah. It was actually my sound craft that took me down. My my forty channel yeah. series the, the two in the case. Down. Yeah, the and, then, and then the uh, Ashley finished him off. He was sitting there programming, and that's when he decided to finally go and. Get himself yeah. rushed to a hospital. <laughs> I'm flat on my back. <laughs> Down the hall from where we're sitting. Hey, bad memories. <clears throat> Moving on. So, uh, Amps. I know Gordon's got a few things to say about Amps. He's. Uh, I'll preface this by saying he's uh, very particular about what he puts in his racks. Yeah, if they don't weigh at least 70 pounds, forget it. But uh, If you can't weld with it, it's not really an amp. <laughs> yeah, that was actually a quote from Joe Tull. Huh? <laughs> the crown belch fire. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the three-phase tie-in? i got to get this amp going. <laughs> And no, I am a big uh, Crest fan. The older mm. stuff, uh, Crown was fine, just, uh, you know, cost a lot more, so kind of avoided that. QSC's got some nice things, but uh, 
like their GX series seems like the power ratings are way overstated. No, it's anybody look, crap. So. Well, yeah, but if anybody's looking to start an entry level system, I kind of tend to stay away from that. All right, we'll the, get power lights. You should buy your yeah, second the PLX right. stuff. Yeah, right. Right. yeah so, even yeah. even the cheap power light series, the PLX yeah. stuff is not too shabby. Yeah, and I think uh, jury's still out on the digital amps. Uh, I've got some people that are saying they're getting good results. Other people are saying that unless you bridge them, they're useless and fall flat on their face. Peter Fried. And fried others just like to blow them up. So. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> now, lab group. No, no, uh, oh, yeah, lab group. But, hey, you know, who's got 10 we'll grand get, to throw around for an amp? <laughs> right. Well, it's, well, yeah, but it's 10,000 watts in, in two rack spaces. So, you know, <laughs> right, right. It does everything. It, it, when we win the lottery, John. Yeah, it, it, it cuts, it slices, it makes julienne fries. It makes Vertex sound like... Like VDOS. <laughs> I think uh, I think digital lamps are here and they're staying. I've been doing quite a few installs with uh, Crown XTI, yeah. and I've been getting you know great results. Now I'm not needing to achieve 115 dB. I, I think you know it's got to be appropriate for what you're doing. But um, I'm getting ready to pl- deploy my third or fourth install in the last year where I've been using. Um, EAWMK boxes with Crown XTI amplifiers, and um, it's great because I don't need another external processor. I need a USB hub, and yeah. I hook it up to the computer, and it's locked down. I can lock out the front panels, and it, you know, it, it has the processing that I need. And uh, I think you know, getting the right amp for the job, you know, is is the way to go. I mean, if you're going to try to power, you know. Two double eighteen cabinets aside, off of like a Mackie fourteen hundred amp, you're <laughs> not going to be happy with the sound of your subs. Um, you know, so pay attention to you know not only wattage but um, you know damping factors and slew ratings and yeah. stuff like that because that that controls what's happening with your drivers. And um, you know, there's a, a reason why the cheap amps cost cheap. You know, it, it could say that it does 2,000 watts, but what are you sacrificing? Like uh, a pastor. Right, you know, <laughs> compared to other stuff. A few so times. Yeah. The, the digital amps don't don't scare me, you know, as long as you're um, being realistic about what you're getting out of them. Uh, the, the iTech stuff, um, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of production houses you know, invested a lot of money into like, you know, all right, well, we were an 850 house. Well, now we're going to be, you know, an EAW line array house. So they, they sell off their 850s and they, they buy the line arrays, but they're still using the, you know, the macro tech racks that they were using to power their 850s. And the, the line arrays sound lifeless. Um, upgrading to like, you know, iTechs or lab groupings or something like that, then you're really getting, you know, the life out of the speakers that, that you were hoping you would. Um, so I, I think, you know, processing it all right and, and pairing up your amps with your speakers appropriately. Right. Well, you heard the, and, this, that was what opened my eyes. It was at the, it was at a festival stage that we usually make an appearance at every year yeah. with, with some actor or another walked in, there's, you know, good old Roman sitting out in front of the house, walk out. Hey, well, what do you got for me? Roman hits play on something, you know, like some Dave Brubeck or whatever comes blasting out. I'm like, what did you hang? It's like, oh, same old vertex. I'm like, right. come on, would you? How long have you been dialing this in? Like, did you, did you finally learn smart? Like, no. He walks me over under the stage, and there's like oh, one forty-eight space with all the amps for the whole for a hundred thousand watt rig, and it was like to eight or ten lab group and amps. And man, they yeah. made they really made those vertex sing. Like, they didn't sound at all. They didn't sound like JB. Ver- yeah, yeah. And not and, to skip over the studio guys, but Halfler was another nice amp. Oh yeah. Too bad they're unfortunately also out of business. <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem, like I, I but really, I do have a lot. I really love Gordon's amps. I don't love moving Gordon's amps, but yeah, they've got those interns. Yeah, they have yes. those those huge. Yeah, but all our interns are even punier than me. So it's like, with, well, yeah, this is where I've got the big belly here, and John's the scarecrow. So, yeah. uh, but uh, you know, they got the big toroidal power supply, so like they really they push the subs around nicely. But they're always in the shop, and I have like some some crowns. That... They are not always in the shop. I got two off of eBay that you. <laughs> <laughs> but I have two QSCs that I bought off of eBay. Like they were five years used when I got them, and I beat the tar out of them for ten years. I sold them to Polly, and he really beat the tar out of them, and they're still going. <laughs> yeah, and these, these actually happen them. to be ten we... years plus when I got them right. from an actual touring company. Just, oh, so okay. I get what I pay for, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we we've had the same Crown K twos, which I think they're I class. So they don't have fans or anything right. like that. No. Yeah. And I think, I don't know, was that the predecessor to, like, the iTech stuff? Um, like, a little, little I don't brother, think, maybe? No, I don't really think they're Apple's. 
to apples. It was a yeah, it was like one at least one notch down, but okay. same concept. Yeah. So yeah, there are the K ones and the K twos, and the K twos have been there as long as I can remember. Like it, the first time I ever saw an amp rack when I was probably about ten or eleven years old. So the amps are twelve, thirteen years old now, and they fried one. Um, I can't remember what they were doing. They did they did something that warranted them frying an amp. That's all I remember. But other than that, they've they've been flawless and. What's nice is that if I've got an operator working for me that forgets to shut off the amp rack and I come in four days later, they're still not warm. Yeah, the whole rack draws four watts. When yeah, it's like right. Quiescent. Exactly. exactly. So I've got that in, in a PLX something for monitors and, and going in between taking out. Somebody thought it was a good idea to buy one of those old Yamaha four-channel amps. Mm -hmm. And and Jeff over at JFK laughed at me when he brought it. He's like, "No, nah, just just throw that. Out. <laughs> get rid of that." He's like, "But he's like, I'm not going to even fix it. So just just get rid of it." Um, and, and going from hauling that piece of garbage around to lifting a 13 pound little guy, I was like, "Oh, I can just have it on one arm and and screw it into the rack." That that was fantastic. That was what sold me. I had Mackie amps because I bought the hype, and then I finally went to QSC, and when I got my monitor amps, uh, I, I've been buying PLs. For the monitors, I bought PLX, and they're a little noisy, but whatever. It's like, I think musicians kind of like them a little hiss in the wedges, so they know they're they're on. Makes it sound real. Yeah, yeah. Like, Ooh, this is gonna hurt when I start. <laughs> oh, but uh, yeah, I remember I got them. I was like, all right, so they're a little more expensive, but they're half the weight and twice the power, and I can juggle them yeah. <laughs> instead of like feeling my spine straining when I pick up a rack yeah. that just has two of them in it. I can. Oh. Slinging around like a briefcase. Quit bitching about my heavy stuff. But uh, anyway, if Zip happens... No, I'm talking about my old Mackies. Oh, okay, okay. If Zip actually happens to be listening, though, I still have my V450s that I bought back in 96, and they're still working perfect. Hey, by the way, if anybody wants a super sweet amp, I have like a four-space PV rack that's good for 200 watts in the four, bridged. Wow. And we're in my junk room. Nice. Anybody needs a doorstop or a heater? Um, hey, by the way, when we were talking consoles, Ants, you didn't you didn't speak up about what you're mixing on day to day. We got, <laughs> you just got that deer in the headlights. It's, it's, we can let it go. We can let it go. It's, I didn't, it's two no. two high def computer monitors, and I, I don't like going downstairs. <laughs> downstairs, we have a a, a Yamaha M three thousand A, and I died a little inside just saying it. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know who you should. You should. <laughs> there's, there's this Let's guy. Say I remember the day that was delivered because I was installing the video, video system in there. You probably peed on it because I was <laughs> Oh, I laughed. I laughed. Yeah, I laughed. I laughed. RIT, so don't feel bad. I laughed when the guy justified it to me saying, that's what everybody uses on national tours. And but like, videos on one. That. Uh, yeah, no, I fixed that. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why. I'm like, no, no, video needs to be all the way on the left so the video I can get out. It's like the video guy shouldn't have to turn up the audio. On. <laughs> it's like, why, why are you running this into one channel? You're not even running stereo. You're getting. Anyway. Uh, any, any, <laughs> so before, topics before I start, topics are bumbling for another day. Before I, I rip more people apart. But yeah, the, that guy who I, I know what you're talking about, and I won't say his name because I'm sure there are other people that would like to hurt him too. Uh, he uh, he just does a great job of doing everything backwards. <laughs> I, there's not a single thing. There's not a single thing that when they hired oh. me, they, they had a list of stuff. What? Oh, I just remember what you told me last week about that uh, tour you had come through with the uh, speak on to line in level on a crest amp, and uh, somehow the crest still worked. <laughs> yeah, well, there was sparks, and I got a little shocked. <laughs> I've um, seen guys do that. Yeah, well. All right, so back back to this console. This guy, just just brilliant, brilliant individual. His wife makes a lot of money, so he gets to buy toys. Um, he he lives close to the church and would come in and be like, "Yeah, this guy really knows what he's doing." And I, someone gave them awesome drugs or something like that, because there's there's no way that what he did makes any kind of sense. There uh, there are wall mounted pockets, which isn't always a bad thing. Like sometimes that'll keep cables out of the way, but when you put zero tension relief on 24 channels of Medusa cable just going straight in there and you wonder why half the channels stop working <laughs> or sitting there for five hours. I mean, like, they're, the ground is hooked in on, like, three of these. Everything else is pulled out. Um, I, I spent a, a good two weeks fixing. I, I have no idea what he did to the patch, but I just had to rip it apart and start from, from the top down. Uh, but, yeah, he was he was the... The awesome guy that sold us that M three thousand A, and I've been usually I'm looking forward to the day when it all comes to a head. But about every three months or so, I'm losing a channel. So 
I'm figuring in the next couple of years, I'm getting something You can actually something plot new. it out on the calendar, yeah. Like, yeah. Good thing they got you inputs, 52, huh? Yeah. Inputs versus good channels. You should be able to know, like, to within two or three days when you get right. a new desk. He loses a channel every moon cycle. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, as long I've got, as there aren't any guest musicians, we've got, about March 3rd, 2013, <laughs> you're due for a new desk. Yeah. We've got just direct, like, in the middle of a service, because all our monitor, like, we've got a couple actual live mixes and then avions for all the musicians, because it's... It's a weird room. Like we can get away with monitors, but the, the slab back off the back wall and the pitch ceilings don't help anything. Um, and it's an octagon shaped room, so it, the reverb just goes. Um, but uh, we, in the middle of service, we just lose direct outs, so you'd lose the bass just disappeared. There are no bass in your ears. Guy had no idea what he's playing. So the only somewhat redeeming quality about that board is that there are sixteen mix sends, not aux sends. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Which, which is countered by the fact that there are no inserts on the VCAs. Uh, the first time I was like, what, we've, got, we've, got enough, we've got enough compression in the rack. I don't need to go out and get anything. I'll just, we'll just bust everything out. And look, it's been a half an hour. It's like, they should be back here somewhere. <laughs> where, where, where are, are, where are the inserts on my VCAs? And call them. I was like, did you just label them funny on the back of here? Is that what happened? They're like, no, no, there's no inserts on the VCAs like that. Was that a mistake? Like, no, we did it like that. I hung up on him. Um, well, there's not on mine, but I have groups, too. Like, right. Well, yeah, but if yeah. I'm using uh, all 16 all of those 16. groups to drive all 16 Avion channels, like, I, I, can, I can set the first eight to fix or variable so I can actually run them like monitor mixes, but... They're true buses, but you sacrifice one for the other. It's, yeah. Yeah, so I can't... It's, and and you, you can't double route stuff through and get... It. Yeah. You can't really do anything the way you want to. On that, <laughs> on that desk, other than... Other can't than get it. there from here, mister. <laughs> you, can't, you can't even gain stage on the thing. That, so. you, ever, you have to start out with all the <laughs> minus 26 buttons down, and then and then hope something doesn't doesn't pop through the wrong way. Like, anyways, back to what Gordon was saying. We had a... We had a... a uh, conference at the church a couple weeks ago and uh, they they wanted to live track the whole thing. It's a three day long conference. It goes from 8 in the morning until about 11 at night and there were a couple sessions so there was about two hours of music in the morning two hours of music in the night and they wanted it all multi-tracked. Now this is full, you know, something like seven piece drum kit, crap load of cymbals there was an actual Leslie which sounded nasty. It was, a, it was an A105 Nice. And um, the probably the stereotypical but this awesome awesome black dude named jake is just a monster on the thing he's got dreads he looks like something out of a gospel group but he's an accountant um <laughs> like he he is a better number cruncher than me and i'm jewish um <laughs> <laughs> who is also an anti-semite <laughs> right <laughs> but um yeah like like all this stuff i think out of the something like 47 out of 56 channels that work on the board. We were driving 40 of them. Um, so then we had a 56 channel transformer isolated split on stage. So went to that, went to the desk, then went back to our backstage room where Alan from Starfields multi-tracked the whole thing. Um, but we had, you know, some guys that lug around here and they're the, the tech crew and stuff, but the guy that actually knows what he's doing um, had to go drive around and pick up more gear for us. So I was like, just put the amps down there. I was like, make sure you give me a minute so I can go unplug the feeds from my amps and we'll drive them into yours. And I should know, I was with Anthony when we started unpacking this stuff. None of the amps, and mind you, they were crust sort of for the most part. Yeah, and there some... were no rack screws in these things. So they're just there's bouncing just, around on the inside of the cases. CA-12s and 9s just flying around in, sh in shock-mounted rack cases. Yes. So it kind of helped. Um, or something like that. So, right. so I just I, so anybody was that there has foam in the lids, though. No, 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 no it was just front to back. Yeah. So I, after after the thing was after the thing was done, I went out and I had to get a, a masonry hammer because I couldn't straighten out the ears any other way and just stand them on and, and and beat them on the sidewalk to straighten them. Could have just dropped them face to face <laughs> on each other. No, they were bent the other way. Yeah, they, yeah, they were bent back because like someone put them uh, like. Yeah, yeah, like they had one screw in them at one point, and then it just ripped out. Right, yeah. So I, I, I spent the $3 and bought them a pack of rack screws. Um, but somebody didn't let me unplug, like, before. They're like, oh, we'll, we'll just plug this in. So they took <clears throat> monitor level coming out of the PLX amp that's wired into one of the floor pockets and took that and dropped that straight into the back of a CA9 and then ran that out to wedges. Wait a minute. So 
speaker level out of the amp to what an NL four in the floor pocket? Uh, no, quarter. It was a quarter uh, inch, but it's amplified. It's right. Not yeah, line yeah. Level. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm. And that was driving the line input <laughs> of, of the, the Crest CA9. nine. <laughs> yes. And then into uh, there, there's an actually there are actually two thirty one bands. Um, this is, yeah, two. No, oh, yeah. two space with two yeah. separate thirty one bands in it. And they're like, there's there's no there's nothing. We're not even getting buzz or hiss or anything. I was like, well, <laughs> what you do? So I'm, I'm well, sure the amp's going in the protective suit. <laughs> turn it on. Yeah. All the lights are on and it's smoking. Yeah. Um, no, oh. So I, I'm going back. I was like, I'm tracing lines, and I thought that because there were so many wires on stage, I must have crossed somewhere where I was. I was pulling two lines because um, we were daisy chaining the speakers, which the monitors were a converted JBL line array. So that was pretty cool, especially the ones that they put concrete in. To weigh them down, like the, the bottom two. So we, yeah, Whoa. it was, it was. I, I like that face. <laughs> so <laughs> just a collective sigh of "Oh, my back!" From it's just a uh, <laughs> look of complete dumbfoundedness and <laughs> bewilderment. <laughs> so, so, anyways, hey, it, were there it, casters on these? I hope at least oh, my no. stuff has casters. No, yeah. I when I when I hit the end, of the, call end the end of the day, I just did these curls. Modern are well, filled and, with and, hatred. And, <laughs> <laughs> As long as Chachi's not driving them, they stay on just fine. Yeah. So tracing tracing lines back, and I'm like, I must have gotten mixed up. That can't be possible. So I went back and I did it, and I had it at the same place. It's like, no, no, that, no. Just turn everything off for a second. It's like just just give me give me give me the stage left mix. Okay, I'm looking, nothing's lighting up. Not not a not a thing. I unplugged it from the wall. And uh, just to make sure I wasn't 100 percent crazy, I plugged it back in and got shocked. I was like, "Yep, yep, that that really happened." They they <laughs> drove speaker line into a CA9, and then they're trying to drive speakers off of that. So I was just like, "We we need to shut everything down real quick and give this a few minutes to to even out because it's probably really pissed right now. Mm-hmm. And if, if I plug anything into that, it's just gonna be angry yeah. and hit me. <laughs> <laughs> Seven, <laughs> Seven, Seven the crest the yeah. <laughs> so, so so eventually I uh, I unplugged everything and, and just like bypassed the crest completely, just use the Ashley and I'm like, oh it's working. I went back to the front of the house guys like who who patched monitors? Like, oh uh, uh Greg. I'm gonna go hit Greg. <laughs> so I went and, and found Greg and slapped him in the face and was like listen there, there are some things that we need to talk about and, and, and didn't get too in-depth about power and why you shouldn't run that much level through something again. Um, I had a hip-hop act come through a club one day. I was filling in for a guy. It was actually my old system I sold to Polly oh, over at, at his place. And this hip-hop act comes through with a live drummer. And I'm like, yeah, we want I, uh, drummer's got IEM, so we need a line. I was like, okay, yeah, let me, let me just finish micing this stuff up. I'll drag you over a line for that. The next thing I know, they start sound check. I'm like, oh, crud, I forgot his... You know, so I answer like, oh no, no, our guy got it. So they they had this they had this was, little was dude. Was this before or after they smoked front of house? <laughs> oh, this, this was also the gig where yeah, I set my <laughs> my main cabinets, my old main cabinets on fire, literally on fire. But that's another part of the story. So they had this little dude with them that had this big, huge vinyl green suitcase, like Salvation Army number, and he just kept pulling stuff out of it. And he had like all their tracks and loops and the IEM stuff and a bunch of like Radio Shack stuff in it and his underwear. Like it was like. <laughs> He, I, think he, I think he wrote in the bin. And probably a female NL4 to two <laughs> quarter inch breakout cable. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, well, yeah. no, he, he just he yanked. <laughs> that is not an adapter that I own. He yanked a quarter inch speaker line out of the back of a good sized drum fill. I mean, I think it had 1200 watts RMS going to it. Put that into a Proco DI. But the brown one that has that, you know, amp or instrument set, yeah. mm-hmm. set it to amp, which is, I think, you know, a 40 dB pad or something like that. So, like, realistically, the inputs of his mixing device were only seeing, I don't know, what's 40 dB down from 1200, because it was a banging drum mix. <laughs> <laughs> and that was only the second day of their tour, so I think they, they went home with some stuff that was not really working out so well. But uh, anyway, we're running pretty long on time. If we talk much longer, I'm not going to be able to compress this enough to upload to my my service at the moment. So I am getting new a new service to stream the podcast down from, but that's not coming until next week. So uh, anybody listening at home, please feel free to contribute. The blog is at, uh, I'll just Google smart to noise. That's easier than me shouting out the address. Um, if you found this, I don't know how, but if I, by some method other than stumbling onto the blog, uh, for the blog or the podcast, if you'd like to contribute, uh, if you have a question you'd like answered, if you'd like to write an article or uh, have something you want to correct, 
anything, anything you want to contribute is totally welcome. <clears throat> And uh, we have had good luck Skyping people in for discussions, so uh, if there's a topic you'd like to sit in on, by all means, drop us a line. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're not hard to find. So, uh, wrapping it up, I don't have any closing music now, so I don't know if I'm going to play the heavy metal again or if I'm just going to sit tight until uh, everybody... Got some gospel stuff we can... praise hallelujah. Paul beat. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Zaz, we're not going to get into rights issues. But anyway, that's uh, that's wrapping it up for this week. Next week, uh, we'll have uh, the results of the EV versus QSC shootout. Not really a shootout. I mean, we're not. Uh, yeah, there's not going to uh, be a victor. But backyard we're just gonna... drunkenness with experimentation. Hush! I work for Wesleyans. We don't drink. <laughs> 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 but uh, no, we'll, be, we'll have some gear review stuff. I'm also going to have a, a longtime friend who's a DJ and a pretty good one. Uh, so he's going to talk not so much about uh, the gear because all DJ stuff sucks, and if you're going to do it, you should buy pro gear and use it to DJ on. But uh, he's got a lot about uh, how to how to be Mr. Personality without being that DJ. So that's that's some good stuff coming down. Uh, we probably also are going to have some folks in to talk about theater. Carl and I have both. Uh, actually, I don't know if yours dropped yet, but it there's this morning. Yeah, okay, it's come it came out today. Um, two articles up on the site now about mixing in the theater, and we'll maybe see about doing a podcast about that coming up. And, uh, oh, I don't know, there's, there's probably at least two shows in there about live live mixing horror stories, and there's plenty, plenty that we could get into on gear. Uh, we didn't even really get to speakers, processing, uh, recording stuff, so... We should probably do a whole other session on just processing and outboard. And yes. then uh, at least uh, probably a, a five-part miniseries on obnoxious, horrifying, unholy sound situations that Anthony's had to straighten out at his day job. So, wrapping it up here for the Smart to Noise Ratio Pro Audio Podcast, this is Anthony Kuzabucki, Carl Maciag, Gordon Wood, and I'm your host, John Dayton, signing off. We'll see you next week. Oh, say failed. Wait, what? Oh, oh dang. We gotta, do you guys, solid state, people. Solid do, state. Do you guys remember what you said? We gotta do the show over again. <laughs>